All right, good morning, everyone. We're ready to start our session of our hybrid church school, December 17th. We're close to, to the end of the year. Everybody else saying we're close to Christmas. We're close to the end of the year. <laughs> two more weeks, two more weeks. It'll be, be uh, New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve. So let us uh, open up in a word of prayer. God, we thank you once again for this time uh, to spend together in community and fellowship. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would once again meet us here in this place, uh, that you would teach, that you would reveal, and that would you that you would write on our hearts that which you would have us to know, uh, that which you would have us to apply to our lives, that we might be better disciples for you. This is our prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we say amen. Amen. So today's lesson, as we continue the to look at faith that pleases God. So today's lesson, uh, the family of faith, the family of faith. Uh, lesson scripture, uh, where Matthew chapter one, verses one through 17, uh, Genesis 38, Joshua two, uh, then Joshua chapter two, then Joshua chapter six, 22 to 25, second Samuel 12, 24, then Ruth four, through uh, chapter verses 13 to 22. But our focus scripture this morning is the gospel of Matthew, the first chapter, verses one through 17. And this is the portion of scripture that all of us love to read, the genealogy. None of us skip over that, do we? <laughs> so our key verse this morning, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and that's Matthew 1 and 1. So our scripture reads this way this morning. All right, y'all, don't try, don't fall asleep on me. Gary, read the genealogy. I know how exciting that is for all of us. <laughs> and a, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zara by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Abinadad, and Abinadad the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Sal Salmon, not Solomon, Salmon. And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. It's funny how they put that. And Solomon, not Salmon, but Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, the father of Bajah and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Verse 12, after the, deportion, after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shalatel, and Shalatel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abu, and Abu the father of Elikim, and Elikim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim, or Achim, how you put down, you want Achim or Achim, the father of Iliu, and Iliu, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Matin, and Matin, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to Messiah is 14 generations. That's the 
reading of the word of God for this morning. So, <laughs> and so how does all of that tie into faith that pleases God? All right, good question. So our key terms, our genealogy, we know that is our family line, list of relatives by generations, aberration, irregular, departure from what we uh, deem as normal. I, I did some stuff editing there. Uh, tainted, spoiled or contaminated, a uh, person with bad character or reputation. All right, so our introduction this morning, the stories of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba raised complex social issues, including rape, adultery, poverty, womanizing, and the like. It is difficult to tell these stories of all four women in a single lesson. And I agree with this, this is a lot this morning. Uh, therefore, the focus of this lesson is not the details of their stories, rather is to examine in broad terms the reason Matthew included them in Jesus's genealogy. Further, we seek to explore how our biases and form our assessment of people and their acts of faith. I want to stop right there for a second. And I want to ask you all, do you believe you personally, not people, you personally, have biases when making assessments about someone's spirituality? Of course not. <laughs> I love Dr. Plummer because she's going to keep it real. As the young folks, she's going to keep it a buck. That's what the young people say. She's going to keep it a buck. <laughs> and I know she was being sarcastic <laughs> when she said, of course not. All right, I, I'll, I'll repeat the question. You can ask me to repeat it. That's fine. <laughs> I'll be sorry. Do, do you believe you have biases when making assessments about someone's spirituality? I kind of have with, yeah, I would say I do. Yeah, I'm just going to be honest. So, so Sister Mia, Dr. Plumber, and I see the rest of everybody shaking their head, the Reverend, we all have some biases. And especially when it comes to spirituality, if people, especially professed spirituality, let me say that. When people have professed who they supposed to be, they super Christian, they whatever, you know, I'm Reverend so-and-so, I'm stewardess so-and-so, minister, and I, I go to church every Sunday. And when we look at them and we examine their lives and there's certain things that, that they, they do or happens, we, we come up with some assessments about their, their, their profession not being, in our opinion, not being in alignment with their with their profession. <laughs> you know, they profess to be something, but their 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 character and what they do doesn't seem to align. And you know, so we did make spiritual judgments about who they are. They told us who we who they are, but we were like, yeah, you know, ain't nobody's preaching. You act like that. <laughs> you you supposed to go to church every Sunday, and so. And so that we're gonna kind of see that in this lesson in, in a sense. And so and so they talked about uh, so they asked that question, why does Matthew include them in Jesus' genealogy? Uh, and so we seek to explore how our own biases inform our assessments of people and their acts of faith. All right, pick it back up. The text and this lesson push us to examine our concepts of who God chooses and uses in matters of faith. Every generation has its own ideas of who are righteous and therefore deserve God's favor, blessings, and special mention in sacred literature. We all have inherited, inherent biases. We all just admitted that from the first question. Naturally, and especially in public groups, we suggest 
or openly declared that such biases are wrong in others. We declare it's wrong in others, but we, we, it's okay for us. This, this we readily do while cherishing our deep set opinions on certain persons or groups. Our opinion is good, but other people shouldn't do that. <laughs> what does this have to do with our talks on faith? And I had to ask myself, try and prepare for this lesson. Our, our biases and deep-seated uh, opinions affect when and how we see acts of faith. For people we like and can identify with, heroic acts we readily held as acts of faith. Such acts deserve recognition by us and even by God. On the other hand, when people we despise do the same or similar feats, we scorn those acts of bravery. So here is your connection. Naturally, we expect God to share our views. Why would God favor and honor persons we despise and despise people we honor? Depending on your views of certain behaviors in this lesson, you will see a live application of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Our ways are not God's ways. And so that's our introduction this morning. And so the first question was, uh, do we have uh, biases when we come to assessing other people's spirituality? Then I want to uh, lift, um, lift the statement up um, the more we spiritually mature in God, we sometimes have the tendency to talk as experts and understanding the mind of God and how God works. I'm going to say it one more time. The more we mature spiritually, we sometimes have a tendency to talk as experts about understanding the mind of God and how God works. And that's kind of what we are going to tackle this morning in this lesson. Uh, so when we look at the lives of these sisters that the writer lifts up in this particular lesson, and we try to tie this to, to our, theme, our quarter theme of faith that pleases God, we may ask the question, as the writer says, why would he include them in the genealogy of Jesus? Why, why would these people be, be listed in the halls of faith? They were prostitutes. They were, they were sexually abused by the king who's supposed to have been out at war, but he on his rooftop looking at women bathe. I mean, I'm just keeping it real. That's the story. That's the story. We all adults in the room. And so, you know, so so we got all these things happening, but here these folks are in the record in the lineology, uh, in the genealogy of Jesus, in the lineage of Jesus. But we say, we know God. I don't know why God would put them, as the writer said, we, we lift up those who we honor who do great things. And the people that we despise who do great things, we don't honor them because we had this, 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 this air, uh, not air, we had this uh, attitude towards them that they not, they not us, they not our people, we don't really like them. So I don't understand why God would use, I don't understand why God would bless so-and-so with this much and you see the type of stuff they produce and what they pick up and they not honor God and they get on an award show and the first thing they say, I like to thank God. <laughs> your art form and your representation doesn't say that you honor God. In my opinion. So that, that's that in my opinion, you know? And so we like, oh God, I'm blessed them to be multimillionaires. And here I am struggling. I serve God, I honor God. And I don't understand why I can't get what they got. And now God uses these folks who we see in that light as, as, as a pathway to get to our Savior, our Dr. Plummer. That's the beauty of it all. Because Jesus interacted with those people, the prostitutes, the kings that abused their positions and uh, all of that, the liars, the cheaters, you know? That, it just ties back, because that's who Jesus See, Dr. Plummer did her pre-read, and I could tell by her response. <laughs> she said, that just ties into who Jesus was. That's the folks that Jesus hung around with. 
Those are the folks that Jesus ministered to. Those are the folks that Jesus got killed behind. And it's telling us <laughs> that we can be that, but Jesus still can save and, us and be And Dr. Plummer says it tells us that we can be that and Jesus can still save us. Go ahead, Sister Me. I see it. <laughs> And if I could, for those of you who are online, if I could kind of paraphrase what Sister Mia just said, um, how can you discredit what God has raised up? Regardless of who they are, what they've done, you, you can't discredit that. You want to, but but you but how do you how do you block what God does in other folks? You know, I, I'm a sports person. I've been keeping up with Deion, Coach Deion Prime, Coach Deion Sanders. And that's one thing he talks about a lot, his social media and his players, his interviews. It's like, man, I'm not here to, to, to hate on no other man, no other person. I want all of us to rise. You know, but people, people have this negative or this jaundiced view about him. You know, the people who like him, as the writer said, they lift him up. And the people who despise him, despise him. But the same coach could do what he did. And they'll lift that coach up, but they'll, they'll talk negatively about Coach Prime because they don't like Coach Prime, but they like the other coach. And unfortunately, that's how we are as humans. That's how the world is. Uh, he, I was watching something the other day. He was talking about how people are just so negative. And people just, you know, just talk about other folks. And, you know, they ain't really minding their own house, but they want to talk about everything else everybody else doing. And he said, I just want all of us to win. And, and, and at some point, I, I would hope that we in the faith community could have that kind of perspective. We want everybody to win. We want everybody to, to, to know this Jesus that we come to know, that we come to love, that we come to worship. And, and regardless of who they are or who they were or who they are becoming, that, that's not for us to, to, to uh, have control of. <laughs> that, that, that's the power of the Holy Spirit to work in that area of their life. All right, so telling the Bible story. In the text, we see in living color uh, gender bias, uh, which was very evident in Hebrew society in, the, in Bible time. Y'all have heard me talk about that before. Uh, Matthew listed the women for which, for which one reason or another made up the, ge the genealogy of Christ. In vital aspects, this was an aberration. In the first century, the listing of women within a genealogy was rare. For Jewish writers to mention, uh, for Jewish writers to so mention women, the women had to earn exceptional admiration, respect, or be noted uh, for extra special work or character traits. So how do we explain in Jesus' genealogy, excuse me, the listing of women a questionable repute. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. We all have some questionable repute in our life. Well, okay. <clears throat> so without a doubt, respected theologians and Bible commenters have offered varying explanations for this. And as class members, you have, have your own ideas. But we learn to, but we lean to a simple view hinted at, hinted at by P Apostle Paul in Galatians 3, uh, 26 to 29. I want to read that right quick. We should, hopefully we're familiar with that particular text. Galatians 3, 26. 26 to 29, and it says this in the New Living Translation, for you all are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ, 27, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism 
have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God promised to Abraham belongs to you. So Paul was talking to, to, the, to the church of, Gal of Galatia, and he was telling them, you know, y'all done had these divisions and all this. He said, but the reality is that if you, if you believe this new gospel, this, this new way, we all belong to Christ. And he had, and he's no respecter of person, whether you male, female, bond, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, you know, you receive this Christ that we're all under the auspices of Christ, that we're all his heirs, we're all his children now. And so, and so here is, uh, as the writer would say, women of ill repute being listed in the genealogy of Jesus. And let me say this, because often we as believers, um, we put the standard on folks of perfection. And, and, and if they're not pe perfect, especially when they say they're supposed to be with Jesus, we have a tendency to discount them as, as Sister Mia was saying. And so we like, how are they involved? How, how are they a part of this? You let them folks come to your church? You let them folks join your church? I don't know if I want to go to that church because you know, they got them, they got them, they, they be doing some stuff that the Bible don't talk about, you know. They be let anybody in there. Well, we let, we let you come. The day you came, you made it an imperfect church. The day I came, I made it an imperfect church. The day all of us came, we made it an imperfect church. And so the perfection of the church is not coming until Christ comes back for his believers. And so we have to change our perspective about what faith means and who can have faith and who God can use faith through. All right, let me pick back up. Um, what's that? All right, God wanted everyone to identify with Jesus. Jews, Gentiles, slaves, and free people, males and females, saints and prostitutes. Still look further, the inclusion of women of questionable background uh, killed the sterilized family tree image purist theologians and comment commenters may have preferred Jesus to have. It would seem natural and desirable to have the spotless, sinless savior coming from a spotless family tree. But God saw the danger in that. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, Dr. Plummer already kind of addressed this, but I still want to ask it. Maybe you all have some different perspectives. Why do you think God allowed Jesus to come through the lineage that had what we would consider highly flawed and sinful folks, sinful people. I'm gonna say the way Jesus came, it, it, it makes it more feelable that you know how, like he was saying, how people set that standard that's so high, how that perfect tree was. <clears throat> it's like, who can attain Jesus? Perfect people. You have to have no flaws, you have to have no smudges, you have to come through lily white, which nobody is. They just, if you see them, if they perfect an image like they are, because nobody's perfect. But maybe he made it like, you know, Jesus came for everybody. He came, he was born in the most simplest, humblest of ways. He's like, I'm every, I'm for everybody, not just the super special. And that's how some people want to believe he gets it. Sister so Mia said he didn't come for like just super special, he came for everybody. And that, that, that we want to make uh, getting to Jesus this thing that we got to be these special, highfalutin, important folks. But Jesus, Jesus was for everybody. And so if y'all don't believe me, you know, you know, they hold the signs up at the sporting event, John 3, 16. <laughs> we know it. it says, for God so loved the special folks. God so loved just the heterosexual folks. God so loved just the people who come to church every Sunday. And he said, no, God so loved the world. The world. 
that who ever believes in him. I mean, and so that's the key to us having a relationship with God. Our belief in what he sent, his son, by faith, faith that pleases God. We know what Hebrew says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so, and so, so we, we put these, we've been talking about the last couple months. We put these things in place to control folks when it comes to spirituality and religion. You know, I, I heard, a, um, it was a clip from uh, Pastor PJ and he was talking about, he was talking about salvation and he's talking about how when he grew up in the church that that there was three things you had to do to be saved. You had to be baptized, you had to speak in tongues. And the third, I'm trying to remember the third one. And he said, you know, if you didn't have that, you know, people wouldn't say you saved. And he said, he remember being 13 and tearing at the altar. And, you know, and they tell him, say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. He said, I got tired and I just faked it. And he said, and then the mother said, there it is, you got it, you got it. And he said, I said to myself, oh, I do? Yeah, I was faking it. And he says, and he says, and that's the problem with the church. We let other five, other people justify our salvation. We let other people justify our experience with the spirit. Because mother said, I got it, I got it. Although I was faking it. And we're not spiritually discerning enough to understand that he was faking it. But we, but we are validating his, his faith experience now because we think he spoke in tongues. Are we and and so and so I can understand the rationale of us thinking why are these sisters in the genealogy of Jesus? Anybody else? Anybody online want to share? Do you got anything before we move on? All right. So under the clean, spotless family tree scenario, mm -hmm. female and male prostitutes. Fornicators and adulterers, tricksters, scammers, thieves, swindlers, robbers, crooked politicians, fraudulent cryptocurrency executives, and misguided religious leaders would find it hard to relate to Jesus. And so at that period, wherever you are, insert your name in that sentence. <laughs> All right, by including these women, God was making a profound statement. He was telling the world, my son through perfect and my son though perfect and sinless can identify with you and welcomes you. For we all are children of God by faith in Christ. And that's, we are read that in Galatians 3.26. The inclusion of the women in Jesus' genealogy says God will accept into the kingdom all persons who identify with Jesus. This includes even those persons who we, because of personal biases, may consider fit, not, may, may not consider fit, may not consider fit, or worthy of God's kingdom. Is that not how all embrace, is that not how an all embracing God operates? Do you, do we, does the church believe that all are welcome to identify with Jesus? What do you say about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was Sister Johnson. Okay. Huh? Oh, I thought I thought I heard Sister Goodluck's voice. So I looked at you and said, Sister Goodluck said yes. She said yes twice. And what I know about Sister Goodluck, I know that she's a seasoned saint. And I would guarantee you that there's some other seasoned saints that would say, I don't know, maybe. 
I hope most of these saints would scream out yes without hesitation. And there are some folks who, who just come into church and probably say no. We kind of we kind of gatekeep Jesus sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we, we gatekeep. That that's basically what gatekeep meaning. We we got an exclusive on Jesus. You you can't have my Jesus. Uh, you ain't you ain't qualified to have my Jesus. You you clubbing every weekend. <laughs> you stand with that person that you ain't even married to. Y'all been living together for years. You trying to come into the church? You know, Jesus is against fornicators and he's against this. And, and we preach Bible, fire brimstone. And we exclude folk because they don't. And, and generally, it ain't, it ain't all areas. We only have problems with certain areas. Because sometimes we can be cafeteria Christians. If y'all know about Piccadilly's, anybody know about Piccadilly's? Or let me see. Uh, or buffet, you go on the buffet, and what I mean by cafeteria Christians, you get to choose what you want. <laughs> you get to choose what you like. And stuff that you don't like, you can leave on the buffet. And we do that with the word of God. <laughs> we choose the stuff that we like. <laughs> and stuff that we don't, you know, stuff we got a problem with, we leave it there. Because we might, we might be one who participates in that problem. And so we leave our we leave the problem stuff that applied to us a lot of times there, but we lift up the other stuff. It's like it's like the whole thing about the homosexuality and, and how a lot of Christians they hone in on that. Oh, they they laser focus on that. But you don't hear them saying people talk about adultery. You don't hear them saying people talk about lying. You don't hear them saying people have a, a focus on stealing. You know, you don't have the same people have a focus on people gossiping about other folks. And, and, and because we put levels uh we put levels on sin. We put levels on the thing. Yeah, and so and so as we go through our cafeteria of the Bible, we eat what we like. And so we put the line, oh, we're gonna leave the line on the buffet. I ain't gonna focus on the line. But ooh, I like this homosexual. I'm gonna all this homosexuality stuff on my plate because I'm a, I'm I'm against that. I like, you know, I like preaching against that. I ain't preaching against cheating. You know, I, I ain't preaching against stealing because because you know the stealing paying for my my being my uh my uh Mercedes Benz I got out in the parking lot. I had to change up, make sure ain't nobody think I'm talking about them. That's the first part that came to my mind. <laughs> you know. You know, uh, but we know he good because we see the record every quarter, every month. You know, we had church, so. But, but I mean, it's just it's so I, I don't understand. Well, I do understand because it's human nature. But we we allow certain things, and we look past other things, and so that becomes a barrier to to those sometimes who want to meet Christ, who want to see Christ. Yeah, I will go to your church. But I observe you around work, and I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't necessarily think you real. You invite me, but I see the way you talk to people at, at the job. You're not very nice. And so, so not only do we personally create barriers from what we think about who we allow, sometimes our actions creates barriers. And so here's Jesus, he comes, he comes through the lineage of these sisters who were prostitutes, who were sexually abused uh, by the king as we listed up. And, and they had these other things going on in their lives, but here they are listed as the pathway to the Savior. And so what pathway have we opened for those who we might not see in the light that we think they should be in? What, what faith vehicle or tool have we used that says, hey, brother, hey, sister, you know what? I really would like you to meet this Jesus I got. I ain't all the way together. I, I done made some mistakes. I done said some wrong things. I ain't been in some wrong places since meeting Jesus. But you know what? His grace is sufficient. 
And the same grace he gives me, he wants to give to you. Would you be interested in meeting this Jesus? Because I know you probably heard that you got to be perfect to come meet this Jesus. I know you probably heard from these other folks who are Christians who said, you can't do this or do that and do that and be saved. And so this is what this particular lesson shows us. That Jesus is willing to accept us if we have faith in his son. And so one of the things I struggled with this lesson, I must say, is that, that the, the, the text that were lifted for us to consider the faith piece, sometimes I didn't, I didn't necessarily see those as faith in God, but they have faith to do something to have an uh, a end result. And so like with Rahab, it wasn't necessarily a God piece, but she's trying to save herself. She said, hey, I'm going I'm to have the spies. They came to destroy us, and they came to do this, but this is what I'm going to do. And if, you, if I do this, will you do that? And she had to believe in faith that if she did what she said, that they would, and they agreed, that they would come back and do their part. And that's what happened. And then as we read the Hebrew text, uh, uh, Rahab is listed as one of the sisters in the hall of faith. If Rahab had not with the spies. And so, and so then we look at what Rahab produced through birth and then that connects to others and then Jesus comes out of that. And so, all right. Having said that, man, we ain't even do the introduction. All right, then it's time, almost time to go. I feel like fair price. I'm out of time, but I'm not out of scripture. All right, having said that, uh, let us look at the, indivi at the individual women, uh, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Elizabeth. Uh, watch for similarities in their stories. But if they were like, if they were, but if they were alike, God would need to need only one to make his point. So also look for di the differences which made each woman's case particular. In Tamar's case, Here's the key question, huh? Peculiar. Peculiar, I read that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, peculiar, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, in Tamar's case, I'm trying to read too fast, I'm out of time. <laughs> in Tamar's case, here is the key question. In your current mindset, your current mindset, can you see God using a woman who used prostitution tactics and tricks to maintain her position in a family line. <laughs> Let, so Sister Goodluck said, God saw her face and her heart. Let me ask, I'm gonna ask. So it said, in my current mindset, now if I didn't know what God was doing, I would be kind of like, I don't know about that. That's what God, God doing that. That's, that's to be my first initial reaction, I'm just being honest. But, but knowing the Isaiah, Isaiah passage we lifted up early, God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And so, so understanding that about God, I would then have to kind of reset myself and say, well, God can use anybody. God could use anything. If God, if we could believe that God spoke to Balaam through a donkey, <laughs> why can't we believe that God has something in the plan of Tamar uh, setting herself as a prostitute to maintain her lineage? Go ahead, Sister Wade.
understands because God allows us and gives us that insight. But sometimes we don't because we only see what we see. So, and like Sister Goodluck said, God knew her heart. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, this is just me, I don't think she was positioning herself. I don't think that was it at all. I think her motivation was to be pleasing to God and to bring forth a male child. Yeah, and so... And so there's a whole lot of nuance and contextualization to what we're talking about this morning. And, and the reality, that's life for us. <laughs> there's a whole lot of nuance and contextualization in life. Uh, at, at one point in my younger years, I was a black and white person. And somebody told me one time, it's like, especially when I first rededicated myself back like 93, and I was that hair on fire Christian you know you know we all been there you know don't you better not don't dance don't you know don't you better not smoke you better not do nothing because you know that 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 zealous and somebody told me once and said man you need to learn how to deal with the gray I like gray ain't no gray it's either right or wrong black or white he said he said no sometimes situations are gray I like well, I don't agree advanced 10 15 years down the road and those words became ringing in my head, in my head, and I'm like, like that dude was right. Some situations are gray. Some situations you want to have a yes or no to the to <laughs> to what to what the situation is. But sometimes there's some contextualization, some stuff in the middle that you got to deal with before you can get to a yes or a no. Well, Sister well, Laurie. I would thank you. <laughs> I would love to say that as a mother and now a grandmother, we have a tendency to turn a blind eye to those things that will stop us from moving forward. Our focus is on <clears throat> bringing forward, bringing our children forward, bringing our grandchildren forward, and living before them so that they'll have the proper example. My son turned 42 yesterday. He brought his children with him because I said, figure out a way to get here and get your presents. Mm -hmm. And he took the time to talk with me about the struggles he's going through in his workplace. He's in the Montgomery County school system and he deals with disturbed children. All right, we are not going to push those children aside. We're going to continue to educate them and shelter them. And because of the sensitivity that WWJD, which is what the J mm -hmm. is, <laughs> is that he listens and then he keeps it real with them. Mm -hmm. And he tries to tell them those things that he has learned, not that my mama said or my daddy did, mm -hmm. but he presents himself as a grown man trying to tell someone to help someone. So these women have lived their lives with a blind eye to what was wrong, but they went forward anyway. They just kept it moving. And I don't think we should <clears throat> make a big deal out of it. Because it was rough back in those days. For amen, amen. We were disenfranchised. We didn't have no vote. We, we just, you know. Yeah, you existed. Exactly. You just existed. And we talk about that a lot, at least I do. Uh, and so, so Sister Laura kind of paraphrased what she said. She says, we generally dismiss the things that will hold us back from moving forward. And that sometimes those things, let me see, kind of rephrase. Uh, so that's one of the major points you made. I'm trying to remember the second piece. Ah, that stood out. And she was she was saying that sometimes we have to share our experiences uh, with others to help them move forward. And, and so she talked about her son and teaching uh, special needs children. And I would say from that perspective, that there's probably some folks that say, either you do this to them or you do that. But do we sit down, as she was talking about her son, takes time to listen to them and hear what they say and come up with solutions? You know, and, and everything not always yes or no, sometimes it's let me think about it. And let me think about it would be that gray area. <laughs> let me think about it. You know what? That's a good question. Look, we are way over time. So let me, I wish we could come back to this lesson. I guess we could. I'm a teacher, but <laughs> I like to keep in the book. <laughs>
<laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. But it, I would, if you did, if you didn't pre-read, I would definitely uh, recommend that you read it during the week. Read the other text that they lifted up, because it, it, I think this lesson uh, lifts some pro provocative questions for us to consider uh, this week. All right, let us pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this challenging lesson. We thank you, God, for arresting our minds, arresting our hearts, that we may look at life. Uh, with a, a different perspective on what on what people do versus who people are. Help us to see people for who they are and not what they do. God, because we all have been on that ledger that did not glorify you, but you still gave us your grace and mercy and told us that you love us. So help us as we go along. Uh, bless us as we go into worship. It's in your son's Jesus' name we pray, and we say amen. Amen. Thank you all.